Um, so as usual, before we begin uh, today's uh, press conference, we have a few things that we'd like to go over. Um, some, some good positive notes that we'd like to start. Um, and so I think the first thing was the Welcome Center, the groundbreaking. So any, any particular comments that we have about the, the new groundbreaking for the Welcome Center that's going to be on the campus? Well, I, I think we're extremely excited about the Welcome Center. I think it's going to give the alumni a home when they come back to UMKC. I'm sorry, when they come back to Rolla. I've got everything on my brain right now. Yeah. Um, but I think it's going to be great to pull all of the parents, prospective students, all in one place so that they can see, hey, this is where we know we're going to start when we come to this campus, and this is where we can finish, um, and just gives them a great launching point to show the rest of the campus and all that they're going to do, especially since it's going to be so dramatic when you come into the campus. Uh, well, very excited about the Welcome Center, but in addition to that, the exciting uh, transformation that's happening at the Rala campus with the leadership of Chancellor Degani and his uh, leadership team. And as uh, Curator Holloway said at the end of the meeting, it's all about the students, and the Welcome Center is all about not only current students, but future students that will be attracted to this outstanding university. And are there any particular highlights that we wanted to go over about Missouri s and I know we talked briefly about their rankings uh, at the meeting today. Is there anything further about Missouri s and that you wanted to? Well, the national rankings show that this university is uh, highly regarded. It's in the, it's being ranked in the same categories as universities like MIT, Princeton, and uh, Georgia Tech. And it goes to show the outstanding education that students receive that is high quality, but is also very affordable. And, uh, and we're going to continue to make investments so that we, we, we uh, maintain that high quality, low cost approach. And uh, staying with the building theme, uh, we also have before to approve some work with Mizzou's uh, new engineering, applied engineering uh, building. And so just a few comments about that. Yes. All, uh, all encompassing. You know, we have another good engineering school in this state, and that's at Mizzou. <laughs> uh, but also at UMKC and the work that we do at UMSO collabor in collaboration with WashU. Uh, we need to hire more engineers. In this, we need to train more engineers in the state. We import many technical talents into the state of Missouri, but there are talented students that want to pursue degrees in STEM. And so this is an attempt to hire more faculty members to arrive at the University of Missouri in Columbia to participate not only in teaching, but advanced research that distinguish this university from other non-research universities. So what we'll do now is we'll go around. We've got three media outlets here today, um, and I don't think we've got anyone on the phone. Um, is anyone on the line? Um, so we'll start with the Missourian, uh, Katie Kim. You all want to introduce yourselves and ask a question or two. We'll give you a couple of questions per outlet. So just keep it to two questions right now, and if we have more time later, we'll come back. I'm Julia Williams, Columbia Missourian. Um, what new aspects do you hope your grandson is able to provide to um, well, he's coming from a, a very successful academic med medical center at University of Wisconsin. His uh, ability and experiences in creating partnerships with hospitals and physician groups and working closely with the rest of the university in advancing uh, not only the clinical mission, but the research and educational mission. And he's going to be a very important part of the leadership team at MU Healthcare working with talented leaders uh, to overcome some of the challenges that we're facing with uh, the need to provide more medical care, especially in rural parts of the state. And you saw as part of Dr. Barron's presentation, we're opening up important clinics in satellite locations that serve Missourians uh, that have not been served in the past. And so he's gonna bring his, his uh, wealth of experiences from his uh, his, his prior positions at South Carolina and Wisconsin to make our health system even better than it is today. Another question from Missouri. Yeah, Katie Kern, also from the Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, so according to the agenda for today's meeting, um, 
quote, I'm using to use to underfund their target spend and their facilities needs are growing, end quote. Um, it also said that 54% of the education and general facilities are below average or worse condition. Um, so as the university is also looking to expand and invest in new, um, new facilities, how does the administration balance the needs for, for, for renovations and repairs with the new facilities? Yes, um, those are always uh, uh, considered in concert. Uh, obviously, new buildings uh, enable us to increase the overall FCNI for all of our facilities. But at the same time, those buildings that uh, will cost too much for us to renovate or, or uh, maintain are going to be taken offline. And that way, it not only reduces the physical footprint, but also the operating cost that's needed to, to maintain those buildings. And you've seen during the past two years, significant number of buildings that were taken offline. And that's helped with the overall FCNI for the university. And that's something that we, we uh, evaluate routinely, routinely to ensure, first of all, that we have buildings that are safe and buildings that are continue to meet the needs of our teaching, research, and engagement. Right. Yeah. Uh, President Choi, uh, you uh, talked a lot about the next-gen menu research. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. Introduction. It's, a, as I understand it, it's a kind of a long-term mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see it as something that will uh, benefit uh, and you long into the future? Uh, I think it will benefit not only MU, but the entire UM system, as well as benefiting citizens in Missouri that will be served by the innovations from the research reactor, but patients that need the very important drugs that only we can provide the active ingredients for. So it is, it is laden with benefits throughout throughout our universities, as well as our community and society. It's a major investment. As I shared with you, the cost would be about a billion dollars. It would take eight to 10 years to build, but I think we're all committed to the, to the uh, objectives of improving and saving lives, and at the same time, developing a new source of revenue to invest in the key programs that the university must invest in to uh, maintain its lead as a research AAU flagship institution. And uh, the uh, uh, radioisotope mm -hmm. production facility that's being uh, mm -hmm. funded by the Department of Energy. That's right. But, uh, will that come quicker? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, right now, we are engaged in a planning study that's paid for by DOE. And if, uh, if we receive all of the approvals from the board and the DOE, within the next three years, we have that processing facility in the location where the eventual next-gen murder will be located. And that's also another sign that the Department of Energy sees us as a critical national partner for radioisotope production. We also have Jonathan Hall from St. Louis Public Radio here. Jonathan, um, the, uh, the extending the test optional um, admissions uh, for one year, can you speak a little bit to why you chose to do that? And is this going to be something we look at every year, or is this something that could be more permanent? So the reason that we made that request uh, came at because of the request from the enrollment managers at the three universities. And they are looking out into the landscape of enrollment uh, and the potential challenges that face us, not only now, but in the future with demographic declines and so forth. And our competition right now with all other uh, public universities in this state going test, test optional for the fall of 2024, for us to be in a better competitive state. And at the same time, we have been monitoring the performance of students that were admitted to the university using test optional, as well as those students that provided their test scores. And, and we're going to continue to evaluate those. But right now, at this point, 
It's a limited set of data, but we're not seeing significant differences. So the holistic approach of, of evaluating and admitting students is working. And we plan to have another discussion with the board next year, probably at the February meeting, uh, to discuss what we plan to do for the following year. Uh, the board has, I don't believe, has made a decision of whether this is gonna be a continuing trend or where we go permanently test optional or revert back to having tests required like some universities have. But that's something that the board will decide on. Anything Other else? questions? Yeah. Um, well, you heard from uh, s and athletics director today. Just wondering, the, from a system-wide perspective, um, how you see the support for athletics in Kansas City, Brawla, and St. Louis being accomplished, especially when it lives in the shadow of the multi-billion trillion dollar SC <laughs> gargantuan <laughs> that is on top of mind all the time. I apologize for showing my Oh no, no, I I like you because you just you know you're doing broad flower language like I use. Um, no. I think we use sports as a doorway. Um, I think sports is something that get, lets students all come together and see the same per see the same purpose. Whether it's you know I'm an engineer major or a poli sci or educate whatever it is, you can all cheer on for your school. And I don't think the passion for sports has anything to do with the budget for sports. I think. It, and it's my understanding, I haven't been to a Rolla tailgate, but I've heard that the Rolla tailgates, you know, fans come together, they're cheering for their team, they're catching up with their class, same as every other college university, no matter what the budget. And so I think sports is a way to rally students, alumni, faculty, everyone, the community, all back together. And that's the important side of sports to me, no matter what the budget is. And when you ask specifically about well, how does that budget rank? I think each university look, can look at it differently. And how Rolla wants to prioritize athletics is Rolla's choice, but we're still gonna be there to support them. How St. Louis wants to do it, that's that university's choice, but I, I love a good homecoming. I love when students wanna to come together and talk about the good old days, or alumni, or alumni get a chance to get back and talk to students. And so I think that's what the important part of sports is as it relates to academics, when you take it outside of the billion, trillion, gazillion dollar SEC. Uh, the SEC is not a trillion dollar entity <laughs> yet. If they were, then all our problems would be solved. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, we have three from the Missourians, so how about we have the third, third, third student? Yeah, and then we'll go back to Jonathan. Yeah, yes. Um, Katie Galloway from the Missourian. Um, I guess just with the new curators that were appointed on Monday, right? Yeah, or this week. Obviously, they still get to be approved by the Senate, but just what do you guys hope they'll bring to the board curators? I'll ask Chair Williams to go first. Well, I mean, I think I know two of the three fairly well um, because of just life. Um, and I know that they're thoughtful people, they're hardworking people, and I've talked to each of them over the phone after we got the news, and they're all focused on how do we make it better for our students, faculty, and staff, which that fits in with what we want to do. We want to make it a, not about ourselves, but about bringing our perspectives to try to provide the best environment we possibly can for our students, our faculty and our staff. And if we do that, we're gonna meet the mission that the state wants, we're gonna meet the mission that the parents want, and our community, surrounding communities are gonna embrace that. And so, I mean, I am excited to get to work with all three of them, and I, I can't wait for the Senate to do their business and, and get them started. John? I just wanna follow up on the test optional. Um, since so many scholarship opportunities are still tied to testing, do you think we're fully realizing the, the, the benefits of being test optional when so many scholarship opportunities and financial aid things and those are baked in, the test scores are baked into that? Do we still have a ways to go before we can really benefit from taking the burden of testing off of incoming students? 
see, I think that was one of the first questions that the board asked, is how do you do scholarships if it's test optional? And I think the number we got was like 70 or 80% of the students still do testing. Um, and I haven't seen a big uproar that the scholarships have had less quality or that the students are not receiving the financial aid that they need. And so I don't, I don't know that that's not a problem without a solution. When if it's not causing an issue, if we're not hearing about it, then we know that maybe it's not an issue that's bubbled up yet. And I think that's part of our perseverance and listening um, because so many students are still taking mm -hmm. the test. It hasn't affected the, the number of people that are qualifying for scholarships that I'm aware of yet. And also testing or using standardized tests uh, can also be an equalizer uh, in, in many ways. We hear of students who may not attend high schools that have the best ranking based on uh, performance, but they do an outstanding job on the test and they get into the university of their choice with significant scholarship. And so there are positive benefits for standardized testing and that's why about 70% of the students still submit their scores. Uh, uh, at the same time, our universities do look at those students that are test optional that are deemed worthy of scholarships to provide them with scholarships. In addition to that, those I'm talking about merit scholarships, but they all qualify for uh, need-based scholarships as well. Maybe one last question. Just in the past month and mm -hmm. in the past week, I've read, uh, viewed, and even written so much On. about artificial intelligence. Yes. Can you talk in general about how it's manifesting at the campuses? <laughs> I, I gotta ask ChatGPT about that. Um, uh, it, it's evolving so fast, Roger. It's evolving so fast in so many areas uh, in terms of using AI, whether it's uh, a chatbot that's used to interact with students that some of our universities are exploring or evaluating how to, how to address the use of artificial intelligence in providing uh, essays that students write, or even job applications that faculty and staff may provide, and countermeasures that we can use to address those situations when um, they're not used appropriately. We don't have a, a set approach at this stage. We're learning as we're going, but I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot more from uh, organizations like the APLU or ACE that helps guide uh, universities on trends like this. And I think the funny part is, um, we talk, we're talking about this in a university setting, but it's also the biggest topic in the legal field. It's mm -hmm. also the biggest topic in the accounting field. It's like the, the students are actually looking at a real life problem and see how it gets resolved, because we don't know. Can you know AI pass the bar exam? Can it provide yes. you a legal advice because you know you can't practice law without a license. A computer can't get a license. Well, then they let it take. Can they let it take the bar? So we're facing that in the legal community. And there's probably I think I've read seven articles in the last seven days about how we are all going to be unemployed as soon as they figure out how to make it legally savvy. I talked to my friends in accounting, and they're running in the same issues and saying, "Well, why would you need to do anything?" And so I think it's a real life issue that's going to evolve as we figure out. You know, what does Congress want to do? What does the state government want to do? How do professions want to do it, whether it's law or, or whatever? How do colleges want to deal with it? So it's a real life evolving problem that's kind of exciting to be a part of the solution. All right, thank you everybody. Appreciate thank, you. thank you, thank you, great to see you.